Landfill. This strange place was a shallow so a sea that split North America in two. From about 95 to 68 million years ago, scientists like. call it the Western Interior Seaway, and at its greatest extent, it uh, ran from the Caribbean Sea to the, the Canadian Arctic. Now, the fact that there used to be an ocean where there is now farmland might seem unusual enough, but for paleontologists, one of the most interesting things about this ancient sea is how it managed to be so chock full of predators. More than a dozen different kinds of sharks once swam over what's now the Great Plains, and so did lots of predatory reptiles like the sleek plesiosaurs and giant mosasaurs. But in this watery world, large carnivores found a way to coexist without driving each other to extinction, swimming side by side for millions of years. The question is, how? And what happened to the ocean that once divided the continent? It's right in between them, toward the T-Rex time. The right origins of the Western Interior Seaway ago, go all the way back to the Jurassic years. period, when this sea levels were about to rise, while video. the middle of North America was in the process and of this time was full of Starting about 180 million years ago, a plate of oceanic crust called the Farallon so Plate started heard of the last from the west, of driving itself it, underneath the continental crust of North America like. along so the Pacific coast. The collision caused the North American plate to bend upward, creating mountains in some places and in others beginning of a shallow basin. The denser oceanic the crust seaway continued to work its way states. under the continent, uh, all the way to modern-day Utah. At some point, for uh, reasons scientists Arctic, still don't fully really understand, the Farallon Plate started subducting at, at a shallower at angle. The at this shallower angle, the Farallon Plate pulled Jurassic down on the continental crust, causing with, what's now the American Midwest to sink even farther. And not long after that, sea levels started to rise. From the mid-Cretaceous to the early Eocene, an increase in atmospheric greenhouse gases kept the planet unusually warm. By one estimate, the average global temperature of the Cretaceous was 6 degrees Celsius higher than it is today. And warmer weather means higher sea levels. So as North America flexed downward, ocean water slowly flowed in. And by about 95 million years ago, in the late Cretaceous, the Arctic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico were connected. Now, North America was a land divided in two. Land to the Laramie, east, there was a large isolated a expanse of land of called Appalachia, like. so where massive crocodilians lived alongside Cretans. early Tyrannosaurus. Uh, and to the west was Laramidia, home of some weird and wonderful dinosaurs that scientists are still discovering. And in between, there was water teeming uh, with life. Fossils of marine fauna like crinoids are common from this time. Paleontologists have also found the hard internal body parts of gigantic squid, some of which may have been more than seven and a half meters long. Claims covered parts of the sea floor, including species more than a meter across, and other species banded together in huge masses, forming reefs. Now, where there's a sea, there are usually predators, and the Western Interior Seaway had more than its share. Fossils across the Midwest show us, for example, that more than 20 different species of sharks once swam in the sea. One of the most common was the five meter long Squalacorax. It was probably an able predator, but its teeth and tooth marks have been found so on the remains of animals heard of the like mosasaurs that seem to you have decayed. So Here's some experts think that Squalacorax like. so was also was a resourceful a scavenger, earning it the nickname the Crow uh, Shark. Slightly bigger than that was Cretoxyrhina. It was equipped with hundreds of teeth interior. so sharp it's been called the Ginsu the Shark states. after the infomercial uh, the kitchen knives. And maybe the, the scariest looking fish in these uh, waters wasn't even a shark. It was Xyphactinus, a large carnivore with an upturned snout that bristled with long cylindrical teeth. But of course there was more than just fish in this sea. Huge predatory Reptiles were out in force too. Mosasaurs, for example, are icons of the Cretaceous Seaway. Their fossils have been found from Canada to Mexico. Tylosaurus was one of the biggest at 15 meters long, but others were more modest in size, like a species of Cledastes that was only about a third as big. And you can't talk about awesome marine reptiles without giving a shout out to the plesiosaurs. The Western Interior Seaway was home to more than half a dozen genera. Styxosaurus was a 12 meter so long of leviathan whose enormous Laramie, neck was about it. half of its Here's total body length, while other plesiosaurs so had shorter necks with longer snouts. Sharks, mosasaur, uh, plesiosaur, and big toothy fish. Now, that's a lot of predators. Of and normally, an environment becomes strained when too many animals states. vie for the same uh, the resources. Typically, some predators would have to go extinct as they're outcompeted by others doing the same thing they do, only better. So how 
did all of these uh, big killers manage to live in the same waters? Well, one possibility is that they all lived at different times in the Cretaceous. After all, fossils accumulated for almost 30 million years in the seaway, so just because two organisms are fossilized in the same place doesn't mean that they were contemporaries. But a study in 2010 reviewed all of the deposits in the seaway, where some of these large predators like Xyphactinus, Tylosaurus, and a number of big sharks were found. And the results confirmed that many of them did live at the same time, but their geographic ranges didn't change to accommodate each other, as so some experts had expected. Of Instead, of all of these carnivores also Here's lived in the same it places. Like. So, so it seems that the predators of the Western Interior Seaway observed a uh, time-honored rule. If you can't the break them, um, work around them. In other words, they underwent the phenomenon known as niche partitioning, in which competing organisms evolved to live and work around each other. And niche partitioning can work in lots of different ways. Sometimes predators evolve slightly different methods of hunting in order to reduce competition. Or they might begin to eat slightly different kinds of foods. Or they might adapt to very specific physical niches within the same habitat. In the Western Interior Seaway, we can see how these predators found ways to coexist by looking for clues in their anatomy. For example, some sharks like Tychonus had flat knobby teeth that were perfect for crushing shells. This suggests that they probably found their food on the ocean floor. But other sharks like Cretoxa rhina and Squalacorax were built for hunting higher up in the water column. They both had mostly circular vertebrae, forming a kind of so backbone we see in many living sharks that have streamlined bodies for life in the open sea. And yet, even if the habitats of these two sharks overlapped, their feeding methods may have differed. Cretoxyrhina had really big eye sockets, but the hollows of its skull that housed its smelling organs were smaller than those of the crow shark. So maybe one shark was more reliant on eyesight and the other preferred to follow its nose. This would make a lot of sense if, as some experts think, Cretoxyrhina chased down big fish and marine reptiles while Squalacorax used its sense of smell to scavenge. Another driving force of this niche partitioning is body size. Bigger predators tend to pursue bigger prey, leaving the smaller prey for smaller predators. But even though there were a lot of big carnivores in the Western Interior Seaway, there might have been just enough variety in size to allow them to partition their prey. And a really useful clue here is the fossilized stomach contents. It doesn't happen very often, but there have been instances in where seaway predators have been found with their last meal still intact. Such so as the massive Mosasaur Tylosaurus, where many specimens have been found with remains of other like reptiles and large fish in its guts. The in one case, a 9 meter uh, Tylosaurus apparently swallowed a juvenile marine reptile that was 2.5 meters long. Meanwhile, some of the sea monster's smaller contemporaries seem to have gone after smaller prey. When scientists are lucky enough to find specimens of the mid sized Mosasaur Platycarpus, the belly area is often filled with fish bones. So maybe Platycarpus had a specialized fish-based diet, and the massive Tylosaurus was more of a generalist. Now, mind you, bigger predators don't always go after bigger prey. Long-necked plesiosaurs were some of the biggest reptiles in the Western Interior Seaway, but their stomachs are often found to be filled with the smallest fish because their tiny heads and teeth kept them from eating anything more than about half a meter long, and eating tiny prey would have kept them from competing with a lot of the other predators. So differences in body size and anatomy and habitat helped reduce competition between some of the seaway's top predators. But we know they did interact. In fact, the evidence tells us that sometimes they turned on so each other. Paleontologists have found teeth from Cretoxy rhina embedded in Here's the vertebrae and flippers of, of like. some so unlucky marine reptiles, including an adult mosasaur. Meanwhile, uh, scars that perfectly match the, the distinctive of teeth of Squalacorax have been found discovered on the bones of mosasaurs and other sharks, state. in addition to uh, plesiosaurs, sea turtles, fish, pterosaurs, and even uh, the occasional dinosaur the that must have washed out to sea. Mosasaurs have likewise been the found with the remains of sharks, plesiosaurs, and other mosasaurs in their guts. But by far the weirdest gastronomic story to emerge from the Western Interior Seaway involved that toothy fish, Xyphactinus. On display at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History in Hayes, Kansas, is the skeleton of a 4.2 meter long Xyphactinus that apparently died after swallowing another 2 meter fish whole. Nobody knows for sure, but that big meal may have ruptured an organ or two, killing the Xyphactinus in the process. Clearly, its eyes were bigger than its stomach.
or its entire digestive system. So there were a lot of ways so to get eaten in the heard western of the lost interior sea bay. But while all of that hunting was going on, the Cretaceous like. Sea so itself was, was changing. Plan At its maximum, around 90 million uh, years ago, the sea was covered everything from central Utah to western Minnesota and from Mexico to Canada's northwest territory. But beginning around 80 million years ago, the heartland of North America entered another period of geologic uplift. The precise causes of this aren't totally clear, but it seems likely that as the Farallon plate descended into the Earth's mantle, part of it detached and relaxed its hold on the continental crust. The result was that the region that we now call the Great Plains rose back up, and as it did, the seaway receded. And yet, it's and still with us. Fossil-bearing limestones left behind by the inland sea, sea are common in many parts of the Great Plains today. Right and and for hundreds of years, these rocks have been a popular right building material. So now, if you take a close look at the old limestone years. buildings in central so Kansas, like courthouses and churches, you might just see Cretaceous seashells in the walls. So buildings like these are the accidental monuments to the bygone sea that once divided North America. And out on the plains, farmers earn their livelihoods over the bodies of aquatic Giants, uh, that beasts that found ways to thrive even America in spite of each other. Thanks for joining me today, and thanks to the Sternberg Museum of Natural History in Hayes, Kansas, for their help with this episode.